Buddy, it's Johnny Two Face here, back with another reaction video. This time, this will be my third and final reaction to the first episode of this early Muslim expansion documentary series by Kings and Generals. Now, if you haven't seen my reaction to the my, uh, fir you haven't seen the first and second parts um, of my reaction to this uh, episode, I suggest you check them out before checking this one out. And also the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical, if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction, it is probably obvious I don't know much about the subject at hand and if I do know anything, I'll most likely pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions which hopefully will be answered in the comments below. With that being said, the link to the original video will be in the description down below. Please go and subscribe to Kings and Generals, another amazing history channel here on YouTube. And um, and as I said, this this will be my third and final reaction to this episode. So, um, and the last uh, part is n roughly nearly an hour long. So, um, this will be a long one. So, I am not, and I'm not going to split it down even more than that. So, let's just. Let's just not waste any more time, let's get into us up on screen and let's get into this. 634. For the next few Oops, months, captions. Bethana, whose numbers weren't enough mm. to conquer any more lands, implemented the tactic yeah. of raids in order to keep the superior Sassanid yeah. forces at bay. The details are lost to time, but the Sassanids, who were used to fighting in pitched battles, were mm -hmm. having a difficult time containing the raids, and one of them... It could also be that they couldn't keep up because of their heavier armor. Sorry, just move that. Even reached Babylon. I am trying to be professional. The best Sassanid commander, Rostam, who basically controlled the court of the ten-year-old mm. Shah Yezdegerd, was reluctant to leave the capital, worried that it might incite another revolt. But Mathana's raids were too dangerous. So the general decided to take command over the forces in Iraq and marched south, supported by the Sassanid generals Baman, Jaban, and Nasi, and the Armenian noble Jalinus. Even before this multi pronged counterattack began, Mathana knew that he needed reinforcements and sent a messenger to the capital. By August, this messenger was in Medina, just in time for the ascension of Umar. The new caliph appointed Abu Ubaid, not to be confused with Abu Ubaidah, to command in Iraq and gave him 6,000 or so troops to reinforce Mathana. The latter was now informed of the Sassanid counterattack. <coughs> when Jaban got close to Al Hira in late September, the Arab commander abandoned it, mm. retreating to Kafan. By early October, Abu Ubaid joined him, bringing the total strength of the caliphate's force to more than 15,000 a similar number to that commanded by Jaban, who crossed the Euphrates and was now at Namarik. The details of the battle at Namarik are not clear, but it seems that Jaban suffered a minor defeat and was forced to retreat beyond the river. Abu Ubaid decided to fight the approaching Sassanid armies in detail and marched north towards Kaskar, hoping to defeat the smaller army under Nasi and knock him out. Although the Muslims won again, the Persian army managed to retreat mostly intact, and Abu mm. Ubaid, who knew that Jalinus might cut his retreat to al Hira, moved his army double time to prevent this from happening. Indeed, the army of the Caliphate reached the city before Jal- What some people fail to realize that when an army retreats, it doesn't always mean defeat. Like it just showed here, it's just a tactical retreat so they won't get cut off. And it's blocked. I mean, I know like some people like me who are not an expert say, well, one, they go north to Anbar, which is, if you can see my pointer, up here. But there's one there's one problem with that. That's too close to the to the Sassanid uh, capital Tesiphon, who can just easily cut them off at Anbar. But then that's how I see it, so them. The closest Sassanid armies to al Hira were those of Jalinus and Baman. Mm. A letter from Rostam ordered them to unite their troops, cross the Euphrates, and attack the city. 
In late October of 634, their united armies, numbering around 20,000, attempted to force the river near Kufa, but Abu Ubaid and his 15,000 were able to halt this crossing. For some time, the armies stood in front of each other screaming insults, until a Sassanid emissary approached Abu Ubaid with Bahman's message. Either you cross over to our side and we shall let you, or we shall cross over to your side and you must let us. Although his officers protested it, Abu Ubaid was eager to cross and fight in a pitched battle, so he ordered his army to do that. Seeing this, Bahman repositioned his troops slightly to the north, allowing the Muslims to move across and form up. Unlike previous battles, the Persians had a dozen or so elephants, and they were placed in the vanguard with heavy cavalry between them and the infantry in the second echelon. Abu Ubaid's army crossed the river in two hours and started to get into formation, once again with horsemen in front and the footmen in the second line. Mm. Bahman continued to wait, and it was Abu Ubaid who gave the order to his soldiers to attack. The Arab cavalry galloped forward, but their horses were scared of the elephants, probably seeing them for the first time, and the charge stopped before it managed to reach the Sassanid lines. In response, Because I think usually the horses have more common sense than the riders. But, again, probably wrong Once, about that. Bahman moved his archers to the front and commanded them to shoot at the retreating Arabs. The volleys killed and wounded many, mm. and when the leaders of the army of the Caliphate attempted to move their archers forward to start skirmishing, the whole Arab line became chaotic and disjointed. The Persian commander used that and directed his cavalry and elephants to attack. While the cavalry was mostly stopped, the elephants easily created wedges everywhere they struck. The Arab army was slowly but surely forced back. The presence of the elephants was panicking the horses, so in order to stabilize the front, Abu Ubaid commanded his horsemen to dismount. He led a group of warriors himself, killing a few elephants and their entourages. However, another elephant was sent towards the Arab leader, and soon he was killed by the beast. Wow. Many other Muslim leaders were killed, and their army started fleeing in chaos, and the Sassanids started chasing them. Muthana was one of the last remaining commanders, and he achieved some degree of discipline and organization at the crossing, leading the rearguard and allowing the remainder of the army to retreat. He was badly wounded during the fight, but his actions saved thousands. The Battle of the Bridge was the first battle the Persians won in this mm. war. More than 10,000 Muslims lay dead, while the Sassanid casualties were around 2,000. Over the following weeks, Bahman didn't pursue Muthana, who withdrew to Ulaiz and returned to Tessiphon. Some sources mm. claim that there was another rebellion against Rostam, others that Bahman was sent to deal with the Turkic raiders. The sources are also conflicted on the events that happened in Iraq later in 634 and then in 635, with some chronicles asserting that Muthana's army deserted and he abandoned all the previous conquests, and others stating that the Sassanids sent a large army under Miran, and it was decisively defeated at Buweib in April of 635. In any case, this lull in action allows us to return to the Levant. The Muslim army was getting used to the new command structure, and using this pause, Heraclius was bringing more forces into the region, by land to Antioch, and, as the Romans had complete naval control, by sea to the various ports. The second group was to be commanded by Theodore Trithyrius, the treasurer of the empire, and in December of 634, it started assembling to the west of Pella, which was the perfect place to launch an eastward attack, cutting the line of communications with Arabia. It is not clear how big this army was. Spies had informed Abu Ubaidah about this threat in December, and in early January of 635, he marched south towards Pella, leaving a corps under Yazid behind. As soon as the small garrison of Pella learned of this, it retreated towards the main army, flooding the River Jordan and creating a swamp-like territory dividing the Byzantine and Arab armies. After occupying Pella, the Arab army commanders decided to move towards Besan to engage Theodore. 
they didn't know the terrain of this area well. So soon after, the vanguard led by Khalid got stuck in the mud, and the Muslims were forced to withdraw back to Pelham. Theodore waited for a week or so, hoping that his foes would become less vigilant. On the 23rd of January, he marched his troops towards the river, with a plan to attack the Muslim camp at night. However, the Muslims had placed scout troops along the river, so as soon as the Romans started crossing, the Arab camp was informed of it and started to form up for battle. We have only limited details on the battle, which, according to the Arab sources, raged through the night and most of the next day. The Romans were able to push their counterparts back to the camp using their slightly larger numbers. According to one chronicle, Theodore was wounded in one of the charges, and the resultant loss of morale made the Romans retreat. When they began crossing a marsh, the Arabs used this to their advantage. They attacked, killing thousands. The rest returned to Baysan. Whatever was left of the Roman army dispersed into various garrisons to the west and south, while Theodore returned to Antioch by sea. There was no army to fight back against Abu Ubaidah, so he divided his army into corps to conquer as many cities as possible. Shurabil took Baysan and then Tiberias. Afterwards, Shurabil and Amr bin al-As went south, while Abu Ubaidah and Khalid marched north. By March of 635, the Muslims were in control of the whole region to the south of Beirut, save for Caesarea, which withstood a siege reinforced by Heraclius, and Jerusalem, which had the strongest fortifications. Heraclius probably thought that the Muslims would be busy with the sieges, and he had some time, so he was recruiting in order to counterattack in 636. Simultaneously, an alliance with Yazdegerd was established. Heraclius married his granddaughter to the young Sassanid Shah. It was planned that the Persians would attack Muslim positions from the east. Meanwhile, Abu Ubaidah's 15,000 were moving north, and by November, took over the territory between Damascus and Emesa, putting this major city in danger. Heraclius rushed reinforcements, which brought the strength of the garrison commanded by Habes to 8,000. In early December, the city was besieged. Habes hoped that the Arabs, who weren't used to the cold, would not be able to sustain the siege for too long. At the same time, Emesa was a well-fortified city, with walls one mile in diameter, a moat oh. surrounding it, and a citadel within the walls, so the defender's situation wasn't hopeless. The Muslims weren't strong at the art of siegecraft at that point, and the lack of siege weapons made an assault impossible. So for weeks and then months, the sides did nothing but exchange arrow volleys. By March of 636, winter began to subside, and it was becoming clear that the Arab army was planning to starve the Emesans. Food supplies were getting dangerously low, so Habiz decided to sally out and kill as many foes as possible, believing that it might end the siege. He left small units to defend the walls and concentrated more than 5,000 near the southern gates. Initially, this sortie was very successful. The Muslims were caught unprepared and were outnumbered two to one, which led to hundreds of casualties and forced them to retreat under Habeez's pressure. However, Khalid managed to get his cavalry together, arriving to the area of battle shortly after. The numbers were now on the Arab side, and this was enough for the Romans to break off the fight and return to the safety of the walls. The defenders were jubilant and not at all surprised when the Muslim army gathered to the south and started withdrawing. Habiz decided that he could score a brilliant victory and immediately marched out of the city with the same 5,000. He caught up with the retreating Muslims a few miles to the south, but as soon as his mounted troops started charging, Abu Ubaidah's units turned back and attacked. A few minutes later, the Romans were surrounded from all sides. Habiz was killed, and only a few hundred of his soldiers escaped. After a short battle, the Arabs returned to the city, and the garrison, which was left leaderless, surrendered. Meanwhile, to the north, 
Emperor Heraclius had been preparing an army to counterattack for some time. Various sources provide numbers of this army ranging from a very modest 30,000 to the fantastical 400,000. It should be noted that the chroniclers who wrote on this war lived at least one or two generations after the events, so their depictions weren't based on first or even second-hand accounts. We know that at the peak of the Byzantine Sassanid War of 602 to 628, Heraclius was able to raise an army of 70,000 for his attack on the Sassanid Empire, but that army had a considerable Gurkturk element. At the same time, the Byzantines had to keep some forces in Italy, the Balkans and the Caucasus, in order to check the encroaching Lombards, Slavs, Avars and Khazars. In our opinion, the Byzantines outnumbered their opponents at least 2 to 1, but considering the logistical situation <coughs> in the area of operation, their numbers were below 100,000. Heraclius, who was now in his 60s, suffered from edema, so he wasn't going to lead the army, predominantly made of Greeks, Armenians and Christian Arabs, personally. Instead, the army was divided into five columns, commanded by five generals. The plan was to engage and surround the Muslim forces around Emesa, and use another column to take Damascus, and prevent the troops of the Caliphate operating to the south from reinforcing the northern group. The army left Antioch in the middle of June. Unfortunately for the Romans, a few days before their leading column reached Emesa, the Arabs learned about the counterattack, either from their spies or from the prisoners they took while raiding Shizar. So Abu Ubaidah ordered his corps to fall back. Initially, the idea was to retreat to Damascus to preserve this conquest, but the city was surrounded by open space that would have given an army with superior numbers an advantage, so the Arabs started retreating towards Jabiyah, which was located between the river Yarmouk to the south, Lake Tiberias to the west, and the desert to the east. Messengers were sent to the southern group with the order to march towards Jabiyah. The Byzantines, who barely missed an opportunity to crush their opponents around Emesa, started chasing the Arabs, slowly coalescing after taking the city. They retook Damascus and continued south, and sometime in the middle of July 636, their vanguard made contact with the Caliphate's rearguard to the north of Jabia. The Arab commanders, who initially liked their position, now understood that they might be attacked from the southwest via the narrow passage between Lake Tiberias and the River Yarmouk. The Byzantine field army could have engaged them from the front, while the garrison of Caesarea might have attacked using mm. the passage. Therefore, Abu Abida left Khalid in command of the rearguard and started repositioning his troops. The latter engaged the Byzantine vanguard, led by the light Christian Arab horsemen, allowing the rest of the army to move unharassed. The Muslims encamped in the eastern part of the plain of Yarmouk. Some distance to the east of them were the lava hills stretching from north to east of Ezra and the mountains of Jabal ad Druz. A few days later, probably in the last days of July, the Roman army entered the plain and built a fortified camp in its western part. With the central portion of the plain left unoccupied, the army started preparing for battle by scouting the enemy positions. The sources mention extensive negotiations which continued for weeks, but the details of the talks are convoluted. In short, they ended in failure and the battle was inevitable. According to some sources, the Caliph's reinforcements, consisting of 5,000 famous Yemeni archers and 1,000 footmen who were veterans of the earliest Muslim campaigns in Arabia, joined the army sometime during this negotiation. The battlefield was enclosed on its western and southern sides by deep ravines. To the west, Wadi Urukad flowed into the Yarmouk River near Yekasa. This stream ran northeast to southwest for 11 miles through a deep ravine with very steep banks. The ravine was crossable at a few places, but there was only one main crossing where the village of Kafir il Mar stands today. South of the battlefield ran the canyon of the Yarmouk River, while deserts occupied the north and east of it. The plain was mostly flat, save for a small hill called Samein. 
On the 14th of August, the Roman army moved forward and started forming up to the east and north of Alan. It is debated whether the army was commanded by the Armenian general Vahan, or each of the five corps had a separate leader. The Byzantine army positioned itself as follows. The light Ghassanid cavalry of Jabala was stretched across the plain as the vanguard, with the objective of screening the army and skirmishing with the enemy. Kanatir commanded the left flank, while Grigori was on the right flank, and two central corps were led by Derjan and Vahan. The Romans had spear and sword infantry in the first rank, archers in the second, and cavalry behind them. Although Abu Ubaidah was the overall commander appointed by the Caliph, sources claim that he allowed Khalid to be the one giving the orders. The Muslim force matched the widths of the Roman army, but as it was smaller, its formation wasn't as deep. Khalid moved some of his light cavalry to the vanguard to observe the Romans. The infantry was divided into four corps, made up of nine units each, with infantry in the front and archers behind them. There were three cavalry units behind each flank and center, while Khalid's mobile cavalry unit served as a reserve. The Arab commander's plan was to defend and tire his foe, and then counterattack when possible. Both armies had a southern flank secured by the river Yarmouk, while the northern flank bordering the desert offered a chance to outflank the enemy. The Battle of Yarmouk started on August 15, 636, with the Roman light cavalry vanguard moving behind the main army, mostly reinforcing the left flank cavalry. The Arab vanguard did the same and joined the main cavalry units. It is unusual to see a battle fought in this era which wasn't started by a clash of light skirmishes, but the sources didn't mention this happening, instead insisting that the champions of both sides dueled for a few hours. In any case, after the screening forces pulled back, a third of the Roman infantry advanced across the front at midday. Whoa. Soon the Roman footmen clashed with their counterparts, while the archers in the second rank uh -huh. skirmished, sending volleys above the heads mm. of their infantry. The details of this first day are scarce, but it is possible that the Byzantines decided that a reconnaissance in force would provide benefits. Their attack was slow and lacked determination. After a few hours of fighting, they disengaged and returned to their initial positions. Mm. The first day of battle was over, and the sides returned to their respective camps. At night, a few Roman light cavalry units moved forward, but they were caught by their Arab counterparts and forced back. These raids were seemingly disjointed and lacked an objective, as they were not conducted by nearly enough troops to do much damage. However, they allowed the Romans to form up in the darkness without alerting the enemy. The plan was to attack the Muslims as early as possible, not giving them the opportunity to get into formation. Indeed, the whole Roman army attacked before dawn. Some sources claim they knew of the Muslim religious rites, that one of their prayers happened at this time, and decided to use it to their advantage. Unfortunately for the attackers, the same light cavalry patrols who fought them during the night were ordered to remain in front, and as soon as the Romans came into contact with these forward units, the Arabs retreated to their main force and informed them of the impending attack. To the surprise of the Romans, their foes managed to prepare for the attack. However, they had their orders, and so the second day of the battle began. Roman plan was to tie up the Muslim army's center and pressure its wings. To that end, the attack in the middle was relatively passive. The Byzantine left attacked the Muslim right head-on. The first two attempts to break through failed, but the Byzantines had a numerical advantage and used it. Fresh troops moved to the front, and the third attack pushed the Arabs back. Some of them started retreating towards their camp, and some joined the center right. This opened a way for a counter-attack by the Arab right-wing cavalry. Its charge wasn't strong enough to force the Romans back, but tied them up for some time, allowing the infantry to retreat. Soon the cavalry was unable to withstand the pressure and also retreated. Later Muslim sources mentioned that the wives of the retreating warriors shamed them into returning to the battle. 
Okay. We don't know if that is true, but the Arab right flank reformed and started marching towards the approaching enemy. Meanwhile, the Roman right, which was probably made of the best heavy infantry in It's the first time I've heard of a wife shaming their men to go back in. It's probably happened before in like other theaters like Europe, Asia or something like that, but it's the first time in a documentary hearing about wives shaming their husbands to go back into battle. In the Empire was even more successful. Some sources mentioned that it was fighting in a testudo formation, but mm -hmm. that is probably an anachronism. Mm. In any case, the first or the second attack by this group drove the Muslim left flank back and they hastily retreated towards the camp. Similar to what happened on the other side of the battlefield, the Muslim cavalry attempted to stem the enemy advance with a counterattack, but it failed, and the horsemen joined their infantry en route to the camp. The sources once again claim that their wives urged them to return to the battle, and even threw stones at their husbands. Wow. As the Roman right was slower due to its heavier armor, the Arabs had more time to rearrange their line and move towards the Romans. An attentive viewer might ask why the Byzantines didn't exploit these breakthroughs by pouring troops between the gaps in the Muslim formations, or by outflanking the enemy right by widening the front. In truth, we don't have answers to these questions, mm. but it can be assumed that the fresh Muslim cavalry in the center and in the reserve probably discouraged the former, while the latter was dangerous due to the fact that the Arabs had already used desert terrain numerous times in the past to outflank the Byzantines. It was noon, and Khalid had just been watching the battle until that moment, but seeing the return of the wings spurred him into action, taking command of the cavalry in the center. First, his united cavalry force charged to the right, and moments after joining up with the right wing, attacked the enemy left. The Romans didn't expect an attack from the flank and were forced to retreat to their original positions, losing men along the way. To the south, the left of the Caliphate's army was about to engage the Byzantine right. Initially, the Arabs were getting the worst of the fight and were about to break and flee again. However, Khalid was on his way. Mm -hmm. He sent one unit of his cavalry to exploit the gap between the enemy right and center right mm -hmm and charged the rest into the side of the Roman right. As mentioned, this was the best Roman infantry, so they resisted longer than their counterparts and suffered fewer casualties, but still retreated. The cavalry unit sent to attack the Roman center right surprised the latter, managing to break in and killing the commander of this group. Wow. The Romans recovered from their surprise and pushed back the attackers. However, seeing that their flanks were retreating, the center also broke off and returned mm -hmm. to their starting positions. Yeah, it looks like that. They don't want to be surrounded by the Arabs and being cut off from the rest of their army. Even though, as, as they pointed out, the narrator pointed out, like, there was times where the Byzantines could have, could have exploited the gaps or attacked times where they could send at least a few troops to attack the sides of the middle Arab columns but again I'm not an expert in military tactics. Both parties probably suffered similar casualties with the majority of the Arab losses during the early retreat. The Roman right lost the most troops and that would prove to be important during the next day as this detachment started its advance alongside the whole army, but stopped well short of the enemy mm. army, with archers on both sides entering a half-hearted skirmishing contest. Meanwhile, the Roman centre-right engaged the Arabs, but this attack only served to tie up this portion of the opposing army. The main attack targeted the right and centre-right of the Muslim army, and although initially the Roman onslaught was slowed, their numbers started to play a role. The Muslims started to retreat, especially on the right flank, where their line was pressed all the way up to the camp yet again. This allowed the Romans to increase the pressure on the rightmost units of the Muslim centre-right and start turning the line. Amir's corps finally reformed and returned to the battle, 
but all their efforts only managed to stabilize the line. The Arab cavalry in the second line attempted to outflank the Romans, but Canatir moved his own to block off this advance. Seeing that the Roman right was being passive, Khalid deduced that his left was safe. He moved the reserve cavalry to the right and charged the Roman flank. The Byzantine commander attempted to move more troops from his second rank to widen his front, and it worked for some time. Mm. However, the Romans now lacked their previous depth, and with this advantage negated, the Arabs in the other parts of the line started to push back. Approaching dusk, the continuation of the battle became impossible, and the attackers disengaged, retiring to their initial line. It is clear that the Romans were getting frustrated, as they expected their numbers to prevail at this point in the engagement. In the first three days, the Romans probably lost more troops, but they still outnumbered their foe. Meanwhile for Khalid, the main worry was the losses among the Yemeni archers and on the right flank. The Roman plan for the next day was to attack the right half of the Caliphate's army to divide it and encircle each corps separately, and then do the same with the left half. To that end, their left attacked the Muslims, and soon the right flank of Khalid's army was shoved back yet again, but not as far as in previous days. Made up mostly of the Armenians, the Roman centre-left was equally successful against the Muslim centre-right. This time, the Roman troops were able to turn this portion of the Arab line, which opened up space between their corps and the Christian Arab light cavalry, which was stationed in reserve behind the center, was commanded to charge into this gap. The Muslims were suffering heavy casualties, and it was becoming clear that Khalid needed to move to the area to stop the Romans from winning. Before he did that, though, he sent word to the left and center left ordering them to advance and tie up the forces in front of them. With that, the Arab commander divided his cavalry into two halves. One of them moved to the left and attacked the Armenians from the side and rear, while Khalid himself moved against the Christian Arabs. The arrival of the reinforcements invigorated the beleaguered Muslims, and they counterattacked. The fight here continued for a few hours, until eventually the Muslims started gaining the upper hand. Engaged from three sides, the more heavily armoured and disciplined Armenians suffered some casualties, but were still able to retreat in relative order. Their Christian Arab allies weren't as able to defend themselves, and lost many hundreds before they were able to return to their initial position. Seeing that their centre had fallen back, the Roman left also disengaged. However, the left half of the Muslim army was still in Malay. Initially, the Arabs had the upper hand, as their charge surprised the Romans, but their commanders steadied the troops, and soon they were pushing back. The small number of Arab archers proved to be their undoing, as the Romans had the upper hand in skirmishes. Apparently, the arrows did so much damage to the forces of the Caliphate that later Arab sources called it the Day of Lost Eyes. Unable to withstand the volleys, the Arabs st Just give me a sec. Sorry about that. That the top I was wearing was like so warm it was making me tired. So oh, that's another thing. Sorry if you can hear that, that's my fan on in the background because it's just suddenly got really warm here, so 
So I apologise if this um if it if it if me closing my eyes makes it look like I'm sleeping through this, I'm not. It almost maybe did because it just suddenly got very warm here, so I do apologise for that. Started to pull back. Shortly after, they were followed by the Romans. Hmm. This attack had the Muslim forces on the back foot and in full flight. It'll probably say then it will probably get to it, but I think this is a bad idea because now, even though these are battered, they can still come round and and cut these two two sections off from the main army. So, right. but it'll probably get All into of it. Them except the leftmost unit of the center. Again, sorry if you can if my fan is loud and you can hear it in the background. Which managed to crush the enemy detachment in mm. front of it and attacks the right side of the Roman center. I still think they're going to get Eventually, cut off. This group was overwhelmed. The Muslim withdrawal stopped around the camps, but they were chased by the Romans. According to the Arab sources, the Muslim women joined wow. their brethren in the fight against the attackers. Mm. It is impossible to confirm it, but it seems that by the end of the fourth day of the battle, the Romans were either pushed back or disengaged on their own. Both sides were extremely tired and battered. Some sources mention that there was an attempt to negotiate from the Romans and that the Arabs refused. Mm. But in any case, the army spent the 19th of August resting. Khalid made just one change to the formation. All of his horsemen were drawn into one large detachment behind the right-wing infantry, save for one cavalry unit which was sent north into the desert. At the dawn of August 20th, the sixth day of the battle, both sides charged and engaged in a melee across the line. After the melee began, Khalid sent a portion of his cavalry forward with an order to attack the side of the Roman left, but upon their approach, Roman cavalry wheeled around their footmen and blocked their advance. That was the moment the Arab commander was waiting for, uh -huh. as the rest of his horsemen moved forth, attacking the Roman cavalry from the side and rear. Soon. I feel like such an idiot now, because um, if I paid more attention now I wasn't nearly made tired by the heat in this, I would have noticed this Arab, car Arab cavalry division up by Kafa Ulmar. I probably Move butchered forth, that name, but attacking the Roman cavalry I feel like such an idiot. And rear. Soon, the Roman horsemen were crushed, and the Arabs attacked the infantry, mm. which broke under the attack yeah. from three sides and started falling back to the center. The Muslim right now attacked the Roman center left from the flank and rear. Meanwhile, the commanders of the Roman army noticed that their left wing cavalry was being routed from the field by the consolidated Arab cavalry and they attempted to counter that by bringing their mounted troops together. Unfortunately for the Romans, it was too late, and before they were able to form up, Khalid smashed into them, routing them. The Roman cavalry wasn't able to resist for long, and promptly started to leave the field of battle. Back east, the Armenians were defending against attacks from two sides, and for now were able to hold off the assailants. However, after Khalid dealt with the Roman cavalry and made sure that they wouldn't return, his horsemen charged into the rear of the Armenian formation. They collapsed under the charge and started retreating to the southwest. The Arabs repositioned to attack the center right and the right of the Roman infantry, but before they did, the latter fled on the road again to the southwest, towards the only crossing over the river. All the while, the Muslim cavalry blocked off their retreat from the north and footmen from the east. Mm. The remains of the Roman army were hoping to cross Wadi Rakad, but the 500 strong Arab mounted unit sent away into the desert had already been commanded to block off this crossing. Understanding that they were in a trap, the Roman officers attempted to form up some kind of defensive line, mm. but before they could do it, they were attacked by the mm. cavalry from the north and the infantry from the east. It was a slaughter, and many thousands were killed in this encirclement, with some units managing to cross the river by swimming. Around half of the Roman army lay dead on the plain of Yarmouk, while the Muslims lost less than a fifth of troops. At this point in this story, we have to leave the Syrian front, 
as things have started heating up in Iraq. In the aftermath of the decisive victory at the Battle of the Bridge, Persian forces made no move to capitalize on it, either hoping that the attack was over, or being preoccupied with mm. other matters. This gave Caliph Umar time to come up with a response. Lacking an immediate source of manpower, the pragmatic Rashidun Caliph raised another army from the previously untapped tribes mm. who rebelled against the Caliphate during the Ridda Wars, including the Banu Tamim and Banu Jadila. These warriors, supplemented by additional contingents mustered by Umar, were gathered and sent north, but problems were still present. Mm. Quarreling between many of the tribal chiefs prompted the Caliph to appoint a trusted paragon to supreme command, who was absolutely beyond reproach. Mm. After being talked out of leading the army himself, Umar's commander would be Sa'd bin Abi Wekas, the seventh person to embrace Islam and a companion of the Prophet. The presence of such a respected general united the army in spirit. Mm. Additionally, many more warriors joined them. That's probably one of the hardest things to do is unite tribes, because especially if they got so much... I don't know how the, how the best way to say it is if they got so much personal rivalry between tribes. Like, I mean, this sort of thing happens in different parts of the world, obviously. Like, you think Russia during the during the medieval period wasn't always united like the eastern parts before it was like attacked by the mongols i think it was by subutai i know this is slightly off top this is off topic but when they were attacked but i believe it was subutai who went through eastern like most of eastern russia and after the mongol empire disappeared russia became more unified if that makes sense how I'm saying it but but Russian Eastern Russia was like a bunch of quarreling city states like they say about the tribes here in in the Arabian Peninsula like it's just a bunch of quarreling tribes but when but people do underestimate like um like the power of uniting, uniting tribes for for a common cause. I think it's just the difficult part is like trying to satisfy all the aims of these tribal leaders. That's going to be be the biggest challenge. But but if Abu Wakas can is if he's like that well known for if and if he's beyond report. Sorry, I'm messing. I'm messing myself up here. If if Abu Wakas is um, beyond reproach as it claims here, then it's probably one of the best things I've I've seen. But again, I'm not an expert in this, so I'm just going on what I'm seeing here. Cells to sides invasion force as it might. And yes, I do realise I've modelled myself up a couple of times, so I have a feeling I'm going to get rinsed for that. North up the Medina Hero Road in May of 636. Mm. By the time it reached the Euphrates region for a second time, the Muslim army was probably the most formidable mm. Persia had faced so far. Unfortunately for Sa'd, resistance to his advance was soon in coming. Mm. The best Sassanid general, Rostam, who basically ruled the court of the 12-year-old Shah Yazdegerd III, wanted to fight smaller battles to minimize risk. But that decision was unpopular with the nobles and commoners alike, mm. as the Battle of the Bridge probably made the empire complacent. Mm. Therefore, the general departed the Persian capital at the head of a massive imperial force, beelining straight for the Muslims encamped near Cadizia. The two opposing armies finally caught sight of one another across the span of the al -Atik Canal, about 30 miles east mm. of Hira. After an exhausting march in the midst of Iraq's blistering summer, Rostam ordered his men to take up positions and encamp across from Sa'd's army. Rather than immediately mounting an assault across the canal, the bulk of both armies remained on their own side of the waterway for several months, with the peace only punctuated by small scouting missions and raids. Rostam probably knew that the previous Islamic army had been defeated during a botched mm. river crossing, 
and was therefore content to wait and receive Sa'd's attack, hoping it would happen again. The Muslims, meanwhile, were fighting a two-front war, so keeping the Mesopotamian army passive for the time being was prudent. In Syria, their army was engaged against the Romans in a campaign which culminated in mid-August at the Battle of Yarmouk. With the Christian Empire's war machine broken, mm -hmm. Umar was free to dispatch reinforcements to Sa'd's force. In the hope of keeping Rostam occupied, the Muslim leader sent repeated embassies to treat with his Persian counterpart, demanding that the Zoroastrians submit to Islam in return for peace. With the Sassanid commander unwilling to convert, mm -hmm. and reinforcements streaming into their camp, the Muslims challenged their enemy to battle arraying their forces in formation and allowing the Sassanids to cross the canal, withdrawing a mile to the rear. With the al Attic Canal bridge occupied by Muslim guards, Rostam's imperial army spent the night hours damming the waterway with debris to enable passage. At dawn, Rostam, seated on his throne, ordered his army across and had the army advance in battle formation against the arrayed Muslim forces. The climactic struggle for Persia was about to begin. The army under the authority of Rostam Faraksad was likely made up of, at most, 60,000 mm. Sassanid troops. Even a Sassanid field army at the absolute apex of the empire's power probably would not have been able to muster such massive numbers, and it is even more unlikely that the politically divided, militarily exhausted realm of 628 onwards could bring to bear anything more than 60,000. Rostam's bulwark was also a multi-ethnic army, having come together from regions all across the vast expanse of the territory ruled by the House of Sassan, from Azerbaijan to Khurasan. Mm. It included among its ranks Kurds, Armenians, Turks, Arabic allies, and units from many other peoples. The right and left center units of the Imperial Army were under the command of Jalinus and Birzan respectively, and in total comprised 30,000 warriors, 20,000 melee infantry and bowmen in the first line, and 10,000 cavalry in the second. Among these troops were 10,000 professionally trained Persian immortals, revered wow. elite fighters who chained themselves together as a signal to the enemy that they were prepared to die rather than retreat. Still don't... Oh, excuse me, I nearly choked on myself. And um, still don't. Ag it's just, it's just a me thing. I don't. I've never agree. I would. I just don't agree with that tactic, chaining yourself together. Because that's, to me, that's just a hindrance. But then, but then that's just that's just how I see it. So, bounded by swampland, which was difficult to traverse. The Sassanid left and right wings were led by Miran and Homuzan, both illustrious generals drawn from high-born Persian clans. Each led 10,000 infantry in their front rank, backed by 5,000 cavalry behind. In front of Rostem's line was a screen of 33 male-clad elephants. Wow. 18 of them were deployed in the center, while the remainder were split equally on either wing. Rostem himself, donning ornate armor, mounted his raised throne just behind the center, accompanied by a small strategic reserve. Mm. About a mile to the west, Saad's 30,000 warriors drew up in a manner that mirrored their adversaries, four tribally organized divisions with infantry in the first line and cavalry in the second. In addition to the Muslim forces from Arabia proper, Christian Arabs from the border of Sassanid territory and even some captured Persian officers had joined the army after converting to Islam. Although Sa'd bin Abi Wakis was capable of deploying his army properly, ailments and injury mm. prevented him from mounting a horse and exercising effective tactical control. Instead, the companion general appointed a trusted deputy, Khalid bin Afita, to carry out his immediate orders and took up a strategic position atop the fortress of nearby Uzay. The various units were commanded by their tribal chieftains, and included men such as Shurabil bin Simt, a veteran of the Ridda Wars and Syrian campaign, who led the Muslim left wing. 
As Rostam's large army continued to form up, Muslim soldiers took part in their usual noon prayer, donned their armor and waited. <laughs> By the early afternoon hours, the massive Persian army was finally ready to fight. Rostam's plan was simple and to the point. Smash both flanks of the enemy army and then smash into their exposed center. The Battle of al qadisiya began with a heavy barrage of arrows loosed by the Sassanid archers, mm -hmm. whose superior bows and higher quality arrows inflicted massive casualties on their lightly armoured counterparts. The Muslims attempted to return the favour, but their low-powered bows and inferior arrows resulted in the missiles bouncing harmlessly off the Persian heavy armour. The amused Sassanid troops mocked the Muslim archers by repeating the word spindles, spindles as the impotent arrows fell harmlessly. With most of the Islamic front line pinned in place by Rostam's lethal storm of arrows, the general ordered a seven-strong elephant corps on his left to lead a charge directly at the Muslims opposing him, followed by the rest of the troops. Frightened by the oncoming titans, the Rashidun mounts forced their riders to scatter from their mm. position, leaving the infantry exposed. Beset by Miran's flank and lacking cavalry support, the Muslim warriors fell back slowly, suffering casualties but not breaking under the assault. Saad, witnessing the danger his right flank was in from Uzeib, had two units of cavalry from the unengaged center dispatched to reinforce and shore up the line. One of these contingents struck Miran's troops in the front, while the other hit them in the flank, pushing the Persians back to their starting position after a fierce fight. Observing that his attack on the Muslim right was stalling, Rostam completely changed tack. He dispatched part of his immediate reserve under Burman to keep that part of the Muslim army locked in place, then ordered the Sassanid right and right center to advance, fronted by elephants and covered by another deadly volley of arrows. Again the vanguard of elephants panicked Rashidun mounts and forced the horsemen to flee for infantry cover. This state of affairs could not continue if victory for Islam was to be attained. Saad, realizing he had to do something about the Sassanids' assault beasts, had orders conveyed that light troops from the Arabian Bani Tamim tribe deal with them. Darting in and amongst the massive elephants with considerable skill and daring, the agile warriors cut the cables which kept the elephants' mounting platforms atop the animals and showered the occupants with missile fire. A vast number of the isolated elephant riders were killed where they stood, while the rest led their exhausted war mounts back behind the main Persian line. The general Sassanid attack on this side of the field was also wrestled back. In an attempt to take advantage of his enemy's lack of elephants, Saad ordered a general attack all across the front. It is said that while the Sassanids were equipped better than their foe, mm. the Muslims were superior fighters. Mm. This level of skill allowed a unit in Saad's... It could also be concluded that because um, the Arabs were lightly armoured, they'll, they'll be more agile than, their heavily, than the heavily armoured uh, Persians. ...center to punch through the Persian line and get close to the enthroned Rostam. Descending from his position, the general drew his sword and entered the fray personally along with some retainers. With the army's morale bolstered by the presence of their leader, the Muslim counterattack was repelled and the front re-established. By nightfall, the last of the day's fighting had come to an end. This first dreadful day, also known as the Day of Disorder by the battered Rashidun warriors, was over. The wounded were get Well, as I said, it looked like at first the elephants did the damage and the other Persian troops were going to capitalize. I think I think it was like um darkness kind of put some was quite the sorry. Uh sorry, I'm muck mucking myself up here. The the onset the sun's the sun setting might have provided some breathing room for the Arabs. Gathered and That's what I was meant to say. by women in the Muslim mm. camp and trained surgeons of the Sassanid army, while the remainder rested. 
When dawn came, both armies once again lined up for battle, facing off until mid-morning. At around noon, a thousand reinforcements from Syria under Kaka bin Amr began streaming onto the field to reinforce the Muslim mm. army, coming ten at a time so as to give the illusion of vast numbers. This increased the morale of the Muslim army tenfold, and Saad immediately ordered another charge all across the line. And despite the heavy casualties that his troops inflicted on the Sassanids, the enemy ranks remained coherent and unbroken, mainly due to the force of their heavily armoured cavalry. Mm. Casualties increased as the fighting grew more and more brutal, but after two hours of fruitless fighting, both sides pulled back. Mm. The Muslims were trading well, four dead Persians for each of their own, but Rostam, trusting in his superior numbers, was content to grind Saad's force mm. into the dust. On the Muslim side, Kaka, displaying his energetic and restless nature, used the break in fighting to cover the camels that the Rashidun army brought with wooden structures, making them look to the untrained eye of a horse like unfamiliar, terrifying beasts. When fighting resumed not long after, the disguised camels were paraded in front of the charging Persian cavalry, spooking the horses into breaking ranks. Mm. Sensing an advantage, Saad had the army attack along the entire front again. This time, without elephants or cavalry to bolster their ranks, zealous Muslim warriors scythed into the Persians' units, viciously routing many of them towards the waterway behind, and almost causing the entire Sassanid army to buckle with the shock. However, Rostam's personal intervention and unmoving confidence allowed his shattered contingents to get back into the fight. Throughout the evening hours, Persian and Rashidun troops engaged in a slogging match, which, as the sun dipped beneath the horizon, managed to painstakingly throw the Muslims into retreat. With that, both exhausted armies retired for the night. When daylight came on the third day, and the armies were arraying for battle, Saad's troops were met with an unwelcome surprise. The enemy ranks parted briefly, and through them marched the mighty elephants, recovered and rearmed, wow. now each surrounded by a protective ring of infantry and cavalry. Mm. That's the thing. That's the thing with defeat. Sometimes it could be the, it can be a, it can be quite the, quite a teacher when it comes to military tactics. When mid morning came, Rostam had his archers unleash another extended arrow volley which locked the Muslims in place. Mm. As this barrage concluded, the entire Sassanid army, fronted by the terrifying elephants, began inexorably trudging onward. Suddenly, as they approached Saad's line, the infantry shielding each elephant's front shifted aside according to plan, enabling the giant war beasts to crash into the Muslim line at close range. The riders were able to escape and fled without delay, but the infantry weren't so lucky. Saad's entire army was brutally shoved back, mm. losing hundreds of men who were gored by tusks, crushed by the elephant's feet, or put to the sword by Persian arms. Rostam caught the smell of blood in the water. In order to end the battle, he sent a cavalry division on a deep flanking attack against Uzeb Castle itself, but this was rapidly countered by a unit of Muslim riders. Mm. Although that attempt failed, the army of Islam was visibly about to disintegrate, despite the coming of even more reinforcements from the West. Taking advice from a defected Persian soldier at the last possible moment, Rashidun light infantry slid through the ranks, surrounded the two lead elephants and blinded them, before swarming the creatures and their onboard missile troops. With the elephant alphas killed, other beasts along the line were overwhelmed and killed in the same manner. Mm. Many others, driven into a rage by pain and unable to see through mutilated mm. eyes, turned 180 degrees and stampeded towards the canal, crashing through the Persian ranks mm. and disordering Rostam's army. Mm. Saad ordered yet another full-scale assault, impacting upon the Sassanids with devastating force. Mm. Al-Qadissiyah was devolving into a war of attrition. Yeah. 
not even darkness on the day of hardship brought the fighting to an end, but the soldiers' sheer exhaustion gradually led the troops to disengage at sunrise the next day. Both armies seemed to be at breaking point, but it still wasn't clear who the victor would be. Mm. As both armies rested, Kake decided to make a decisive move. Under the cover of a brief sandstorm, he and 700 troops launched an attack on the blinded Persian center, breaking through the line and approaching Rostam. Isolated and disoriented, the Sassanid general was found by a Rashidun soldier and slain. Wow. Fighting continued until rumors of their commander's fate spread around the Persian army. At that point, the center finally cracked and routed towards mm. the river, followed shortly after by both flanks. The imperial army of the Sassanid Empire had wow. been defeated. The Sassanids lost more than 20,000, while the Muslim losses were less than 10,000. Mm. Although the Muslims seemingly scored decisive victories against two of the strongest empires of the period, the war in the region was hardly over. The next episodes of this series on early Muslim expansion will take us to Egypt, Constantinople, Central Asia, Spain and France. So make sure you mm. are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We and that'll do it. This is a... Uh so we finally got there. The the la my my final reaction to the first episode in this um early Muslim expansion series, and I'm sorry for delaying it. So um yeah, so so that was quite that's been quite the episode, and obviously because again I split into three parts, obviously because it's like two hours long, but like and. And man, this is a lot of it, especially between the the Muslims and the Sassanids, has been pretty back and forth. And um, and when facing the Romans, I think there was a quite a few opportunities that the Romans should have taken if they were to gain the upper hand against the Muslims. But the Muslim the Muslims took advantage of their advantages better than better than their counterparts. So um. But that's how I see it. But I'm sure I'll be correct in the in the um, in the comment section. So, so anyway, this has been this this is um this is the this is the end of the reaction to my the end of my reaction to the first episode. If you like this reaction, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.